Hey, everybody. Uh, I'm Whitney Webb. I'm an investigative journalist. <laughs> Thanks. <clears throat> cool. Thanks for that. Um, I'm an investigative journalist. I've been writing professionally since 2016. I'm the founder of and contributing editor to Unlimited unlimitedhangout.com. Uh, today, I'm gonna be speaking about the imminent effort to not just criminalize Bitcoin and financial privacy, but how that effort directly coincides with efforts to undermine free speech and the right to privacy in general. While many of these efforts are taking place at the international level, they intimately, uh, intimately involve powerful American federal agencies, American commercial banks, and the Federal Reserve. Late last month, a bipartisan group of U.S. Senators introduced the Financial Technology Protection Act, which would, quote, create a working group tasked with studying how terrorists or other criminals might use cryptocurrencies and other financial technologies and create proposals for Congress and regulatory agencies aimed at countering these uses, end quote. This working group would be composed of representatives of the U.S. Treasury Department, the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, or FinCEN, the IRS, the Office of Foreign Asset Control, the FBI, the Drug Enforcement Agency, the Department of Homeland Security, the Department of Justice, the Department of State, and the CIA. Bitcoiners should, play cl uh, should pay close attention to these developments, as the DOJ in particular has attempted to paint Bitcoin as the payment of choice for well-known terror groups like ISIS and Al-Qaeda, signaling that this working group proposed by this bill will likely seek to specifically target Bitcoin. Adding to this concern is the fact that a slew of recent, recent mainstream media reports, which cite Treasury and FinCEN officials, DOJ officials, and CIA analysts, have claimed that, quote, terrorists are turning to Bitcoin and they're learning fast. That Bitcoin is the, quote, new frontier in terror financing. And that, quote, Bitcoin is helping terrorists secretly fund their deadly attacks. Even the prominent military think tank Rand Corporation has argued that Bitcoin and the dark web are the newest terrorist threat. Many of these entities, particularly the U.S. Department of Justice, are also currently helping draft the UN's new cybercrime treaty, showing that there is currently a very global effort to stomp out cybercrime and alleged funding sources for cybercriminals. However, much like the words terror and terrorist after 9-11, the terms cybercrime and cybercriminals are often very vaguely defined by these same authorities. Perhaps unsurprisingly, many of the groups looking to allegedly combat cybercrime in the U.S. and beyond, including the Department of Justice and the FBI, are part of an international public-private partnership housed within the World Economic Forum that is seeking to define these terms in unsettling ways. Not only that, but this group and its partner organizations are also seeking policy objectives that, if widely implemented, would cr treat anonymous cryptocurrency transactions and specifically Bitcoin transactions involving mixers and related privacy tools as criminal. They also, without evidence, assert that there is a direct link between an increase in the value of cryptocurrencies, specifically Bitcoin, and an increase in cyber criminal activity. This public-private partnership, the WEF Partnership Against Cybercrime, or WEFPAC, is run by a former intelligence agent named Tal Goldstein, whose military career, or military intelligence career rather, was marked by his efforts to have intelligence agencies essentially fuse with private technology companies and his native Israel. Today, WEFPAC's members not only include the FBI, the Department of Justice, the US Secret Service, and intelligence agencies of Israel and Britain, they also include massive too big to fail banks, like Bank of America and Santander, as well as massive tech companies like Amazon and Microsoft. PayPal is also there. So is the nonprofit that manages the SWIFT payment system. In recent reports, WEFPAC has alleged that there is a connection between the use of cryptocurrencies as well as cyber, uh, sorry, privacy enhancing tools such as mixers and the incidents of cybercrime. They argue that, quote, Cyber criminals abuse encryption, cryptocurrencies, anonymity services, and other technologies, but fail to note that their use is hardly exclusive to criminals. 
Though they refrain from naming any currency specifically, the WEF has stated elsewhere on its website that, quote, governments don't like the fact that Bitcoin users are anonymous and they have concerns over its use for criminal activity and money laundering, adding that their worries aren't unfounded. It's important to point out that WEFPAC doesn't see cyber criminals, just as those who may engage in hacks or financially motivated acts like ransomware attacks. To WEFPAC, cyber criminals also include those who use technologies to uphold terrorism and spread disinformation to destabilize governments and democracies. From that, it seems that WEFPAC's inclusion of disinformation as a type of cyber crime betrays an intention to develop policies that under the guise of, de of combating cybercrime will instead promote increased online censorship, particularly of independent media. In discussing solutions, WEFPAC calls for the global targeting of infrastructures and assets deemed to facilitate cybercrime, including those which enable cybercriminal revenue streams, which as we will see shortly, refers to infrastructure that allows for more private cryptocurrency transactions and enables, quote, the promotion of illegal sites and the hosting of criminal content. In another section, the group discusses seizing the websites of cyber criminals as an attractive possibility. Given that WEFPAC and its members, like the FBI, view disinformation as a form of cyber crime, this could potentially see independent media websites and the infrastructure that allows them to operate and finance their work, like video sharing and payment platforms that do not censor, emerge as targets. Earlier this month, the FBI, in coordination with the National Police of Ukraine, did just this, seizing nine crypto exchanges, the majority of which had Bitcoin or BTC in the domain name. Their crime? Offering, quote, anonymous cryptocurrency exchange services to website visitors. WIFPAC further argues that, quote, in order to reduce the global impact of cybercrime and to systematically restrain cyber criminals, cyber crime must be confronted at its source. By raising the cost of conducting cyber crimes, cutting the activity's profitability, and deterring criminals by increasing the direct risk they face. And then argues, unsurprisingly, that because the cyber crime threat is global in scope, its solution must also be a globally coordinated effort. They say that the main way to achieve this involves, quote, harnessing the private sector to work side by side with law enforcement officials. Shockingly, WEFPAC calls for this cooperation to take place even if it is not, quote, always aligned with existing legislative and operational frameworks. In other words, they are saying this cooperation should be allowed to take place even if it is illegal. So how exactly do the members of WEFPAC plan on confronting cybercrime at its source? While they are tight-lipped on exact measures, another group they work closely with and that has considerable overlap with WEFPAC has some ideas. The Financial Services Information Sharing and Analysis Center, or FSISAC, officially exists to, quote, help ensure the resilience and continuity of the global financial services infrastructure and individual firms against acts that could significantly impact the sector's ability to provide services critical to the orderly function of the global economy. In other words, FSISAC allows the private financial services industry to decide on and coordinate sector-wide responses regarding how financial services are provided during and after a given crisis, including a cyber attack or sector-wide concern over cybercrime. FSISAC was tellingly created in 1999, the same year that Glass-Steagall was repealed. FSISAC, uh, their members include the biggest firms on Wall Street. Citigroup, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, and Morgan Stanley are among its members and much of their leadership contributes to, works for, or shares committees and initiatives of the World Economic Forum, including those focused on cybercrime and ransomware. In 2021, FSISAC's Global Intelligence Office released several predictions for 2021 and beyond. Most of these predictions express concern about a coming cyber calamity, though one prediction in particular, in particular stands out, 
that, quote, economic drivers towards cybercrime will increase. FSI SAC claims that the current economic situation created in the wake of COVID-related lockdowns will, quote, make cybercrime an ever more attractive alternative, stating immediately afterwards that, quote, dramatic increases in cryptocurrency valuation will drive threat actors to conduct campaigns capitalizing on this market including extortion campaigns against financial institutions and their customers. In other words, FSISAC views the increase in the value of cryptocurrency as a direct driver of cybercrime, particu particularly for ransomware incidents, implying that the value of cryptocurrency must be dealt with if there is to be a reduction in cybercrime and if cybercrime is to be truly confronted at its source by attacking its profitability, as WEFPAC suggests. However, the data does not fit these assertions as the use of s cryptocurrency by cyber criminals is low and is getting lower. For instance, one recent study, ironically produced by WEFPAC member Chainalysis, found that only 0.34% of cryptocurrency transactions in 2020 were tied to criminal activity, down from 2% the year prior. Though the decrease may be due to a jump in cryptocurrency adoption, the overall percentage of crime-linked cryptocurrency transactions is incredibly low, a fact obviously known to FSISAC and its members. But what's disturbing here is that mainstream media has widely circulated the claim that Bitcoin specifically is, to quote Forbes, driving the 1.4 billion ransomware industry, or to quote NPR, Bitcoin has fueled ransomware attacks. Or to quote an executive at WEFPAC member Chainalysis, Bitcoin is the favorite by far for ransomware attackers. I could give infinite examples as there is truly an abundance of reports just like these that blame a jump in well-publicized cybercrime events, specifically ransomware attacks, on Bitcoin's increasing popularity and its intrinsic value. Yet here, if the banks, intelligence agencies, and tech companies that partnered with these initiatives see not just financial privacy, but the value of Bitcoin itself as a threat, it goes without saying that their efforts to stop cybercrime at its source would not just involve eradicating financial privacy when it comes to crypto, but also working to devalue crypto. With such groups openly discussing working outside of legal frameworks to accomplish their goals, Bitcoiners must start paying closer attention to these shadowy groups. There is no proof that cryptocurrency, or more specifically Bitcoin, is the key driver of cybercrime, as cybercrime significantly predates the existence of both. However, cryptocurrency does present a threat to the plans of FSISAC members and their partners to begin producing digital currencies controlled either by a approved commercial banks or central banks themselves, digital currencies that are designed to be easily surveilled. Central bank digital currencies in particular are being designed and implemented to erode financial privacy and autonomy. The success of CBDCs and related projects depends on neutering the competition, which is likely why FSISAC has called for the economic drivers of cybercrime to be combated by, by a global financial cyber utility, which is, of course, the very same globalist entity that WEFPAC seeks to create. Not long before FSISAC and WEFPAC made all of these claims, many members of both groups participated in a 2020 initiative hosted by the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, itself a member of WEFPAC. The president of the endowment at the time was William Burns, who subsequently became Joe Biden's pick for CIA director less than a year later. The Carnegie Endowments Initiative brought together many members of WEFPAC and FSISAC with an important addition, representatives of central banks, namely the U.S. Federal Reserve and the European Central Bank. Also notably present in this initiative was the U.S.'s Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, or the FDIC. The report developed by these parties is astounding, as it states that the main cause of global financial instability is not irresponsible central bank policies or commercial banks engaging in criminal behavior, but instead, quote, the current fragmentation among stakeholders and initiatives. 
They argue that the main solution needed to stabilize the global financial system lies in reducing that fragmentation. The only way to accomplish that, they say, requires the massive reorganization of all stakeholders via in, uh, increased global coordination. They specifically note that the, quote, disconnect between the finance, the national security, and the diplomatic communities is particularly pronounced and calls for much closer interaction between all three. It goes on to state the following, quote, this requires countries not only to better organize themselves domestically, but also to strengthen international cooperation to defend against, investigate, prosecute, and ideally prevent future attacks. This implies that the financial sector and financial authorities must regularly interact with law enforcement and other national security agencies in unprecedented ways, both domestically and internationally, end quote. Essentially, this initiative has called to begin fusing commercial banks and financial authorities, like regulators, with national security and law enforcement agencies. This policy could not be more insane or dystopian. Making things even worse is the fact that WEFPAC, of which the Carnegie Endowment and many of the other organizations behind this policy are members, not only call for this fusion to take place, they call to do so in ways, again, that may be illegal. A merging of commercial banks, their regulators, and the intelligence agencies is a complete nightmare scenario, but this is exactly what the World Economic Forum has come to promote as a model public-private partnership. But perhaps more critically for American citizens, this is a policy developed with the direct participation of the US Federal Reserve, the FDIC, the US Secret Service, the FBI, the Department of Justice, and the country's most systemically important commercial banks. The establishment in this country supports these policies. And from what I can see, they have every intention of trying to make them a reality. These American federal agencies, institutions, and commercial banks are playing a major role in developing regulations that will inevitably target Bitcoin. They have made it very clear in media reports, press releases, and policy documents that they see financial privacy, the popularity of Bitcoin, and the value of Bitcoin as direct threats responsible for what they define as cybercrime. Yet time and again, the American people have been fleeced and looted by many of these same agencies and many of these same commercial and central banks. The big banks like HSBC can launder millions of dollars for drug cartels. Nothing happens to them, no one goes to jail. The CIA has laundered untold millions through criminal banks like BCCI, a bank which ran its own sex trafficking operation involving prepubescent kids. And again, nothing was done, no one went to jail. FTX can launder aid money supposedly destined for Ukraine, funnel it back as campaign contributions to the same political party, developing crypto regulations while painting Bitcoin as a national security threat. Sam Bankman Fried was the only person arrested, and right now he's not in prison. He's in a multi million dollar mansion in California, about to get 10 of the 13 federal charges against him dismissed. The current president's son can launder as much money as he wants after leaving the evidence on a laptop he abandoned, and the intelligence community comes to his defense, falsely claiming that the data on his laptop, now admitted to be his, was a Russian hoax. These guys are the real criminals, and if you think they care about stopping money laundering or cybercrime in any meaningful way, you have been had. <laughs> But soon, if nothing is done to stop these policies that are being drafted behind closed doors, use a Bitcoin mixer and take steps to keep your Bitcoin transactions anonymous or more private, you'll be accused of suspiciously acting like a cyber criminal. Complain about the obvious double standard, you'll be accused of spreading disinformation and become a cyber criminal yourself. What should particularly concern us now is how these agencies, entities, and public-private partnerships plan to manufacture consent for their policies. As things stand right now, a lot of the policies dreamt up by these groups that I've just described, I would hope, 
would be rejected by the vast majority of Americans. That is, of course, unless the right crisis were to come along and suddenly make most Americans extremely concerned and fearful of cybercrime. While warnings of a so-called cyber pandemic floated around in 2021 as a series of high profile and highly publicized ransomware attacks took place, we haven't heard as much since. But now with the last global crisis, COVID-19 officially over, according to the US government and the World Health Organization, some are raising the alarm that a new global crisis is soon to make a dramatic appearance. Given what I've been saying, let's check in with the World Economic Forum and see what they think the next global crisis will be. Well, in January of this year, Jeremy Jurgens, number two at the WEF after Klaus Schwab, asserted that a, quote, catastrophic mutating event will strike the world in two years. What a confident prediction. So what is this catastrophic mutating event that will strike the world before 2025? If you guessed a quote, global catastrophic cyber event, you win. At a presentation at this year's Davos, Jurgens claimed that 93% of cyber leaders and 86% of cyber business leaders believe that the geopolitical instability makes a catastrophic cyber event inevitable before 2025. Joining Jurgens in fear-mongering over a cyber doomsday was Jurgen Stock, the head of Interpol, one of the most influential members of WEFPAC. I should also add that, you, that the United Nations, which as I mentioned earlier, is currently making its new cybercrime treaty, has named Interpol as uniquely positioned to be the implementing partner of a number of the 2030 sustainable development goals, specifically when it comes to disrupting financial streams of a terrorist, securing cyberspace, and curbing illicit markets. Jurgens and Stock's comments about a catastrophic cyber attack before 2025 spawned hysterical mainstream media headlines warning of cyber apocalypse 2023. That same month, Newsweek's print edition featured an ominous hacker on the cover with the words, hack attack, how cyber criminals outwit all efforts to stop them. Many of the experts quoted in the hack attack article work for companies that are WEFPAC members. In recent years, there has been much talk about a doomsday cyber attack, and now it seems top people at the WEF and WEFPAC feel confident enough to put a relatively short timeline on it. How bad will this attack be if and when it materializes, considering that the current head of the Department of Homeland Security has claimed that the next cyber attack will kill many people, it seems that a cyber 9-11 could be waiting in the wings, which of course would be followed shortly thereafter by a cyber patriot act or something very similar. If Bitcoin is blamed for motivating or funding the cyber criminals deemed responsible for such a catastrophe, what will happen to public opinion and what type of legislation might we see rammed through Congress? Given what I've described today, the WEF and its allies, including several US government agencies, need a couple of things to come to the forefront of the public mind before they can offer their dystopian solutions that they already have on the books. In order to fuse banks, Regulators and the national security state to end fragmentation in the global financial system, global financial instability must first become a major global concern. With everything that has been taking place since, since the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank, it seems we may not be too far away from global financial instability became it becoming a top concern for the average person. The other thing they need for, to happen is for the average person to become incredibly fearful of financial privacy and online privacy to the point that they will willingly trade their privacy for greater security, or rather what will be sold as greater security. Bitcoin, privacy-minded crypto, and privacy-preserving technologies like encryption must become public enemy number one in order for the offered solution, a completely surveilled internet, and completely surveilled financial system to be accepted by the masses. Ultimately, what I'm trying to convey with this information is that the fight over the control of the cryptocurrency space is part of the larger war being fought over the future of our society, our country, and the world. 
Will we sleepwalk into a world of CBDCs where intelligence agencies, central banks, and commercial banks have fused into the same Orwellian entity where holding terror-linked Bitcoin or using encryption or mixers makes you a cyber criminal? Or will we fight the groups and institutions that have looted American wealth for well over a century and demand a return to the Constitution and the right to privacy, not just financially, but in all senses? Those that wish to force us into the former scenario clearly and unequivocally see Bitcoin as well as privacy enhancing technology as a direct threat to their power and their plans. And there has never been a more important time to choose a side. Thank you. <laughs>